Okay, I'll get you a slide. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to see you this morning. Sunshine outside. It's maybe I'll just meet out there. And didn't know what that was when it first came out yesterday. What is it? <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is good to see you this morning. Um, the sermon title hopefully will kind of speak for itself, what to do when you don't know what to do. Anybody there today? Uh, I, one thing that comes down to sermon preparation, I, uh, I spend a lot of time preparing to prepare, if that makes any sense. Laying out, you know, uh, each quarter as it comes up and hopefully by the end of the year, by somewhere around this time of year, I kind of have the whole, for the most part, planned out. Well, that didn't happen this year. It's been very frustrating. I'm one of those kind of guys that, you know, I like to have a plan and go according to that plan. Then with the, everything that we experienced at the end of the year with loss and family and all those other things that just, uh, for those who experienced those things, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It kind of paralyzes you mentally. <laughs> Anybody been there? Uh, I, I was living mostly there anyway, so it made it even twice as hard. <laughs> but, uh, I told my wife last week, I said, you know, uh, I'm really struggling. And she said, I just know how to preach and since, you know, it's, everything's going on. I just haven't been able to focus in, in this regard. I mean, I've got all these things that I'm doing, but just, just focusing in, in this particular zone has just really been a struggle. She said, well, you know what preached last Sunday? I said, I prepared that in November <laughs> for that Sunday, you know, so I had it ready. But uh, when it comes to the first year, it was, just, it was just a real struggle. The more I wrestled with it, the more frustrated I got. Come, come Thursday morning, I was, you know, kind of had a revelation really Wednesday evening as I was going to bed, just about, you know, what to do. And finally, here came this sermon title. <laughs> I said, that'll preach. What do you do? <laughs> so just going back over a lot of life experiences and taking the word of God and looking for those basic principles which we need to adhere to, uh, this, this message has been born in the furnace, so to say. But I really believe it's a good word, especially, you know, January is always a, a, a time of introspection for a lot of people. We look at our life, where we've been, where we're headed, you know, uh, try to make some adjustments, you know, I'm gonna lose weight, whatever it's gonna be like that, kind of all falls into category. Yeah, it's, it's end of January and you lost already, okay. It's not too late to start doing what's right, remember, we've discussed that. <laughs> but uh, in the context of all that, I really believe this is a message that, that will minister to you because it has to me. And I usually know when something's gonna minister to you because it's ministering to me. Contrary to popular opinions, pastors are people. Some of you weren't crying, that's a shock. <laughs> Hold on, they are people. And so many of the things that, uh, that are birthed out of my heart and spirit in, in sermons are stuff where the Lord's just leading me and speaking my heart about anyway. So if it's, you know, it's, it's something that uh, I, I wanna be, I don't wanna be preaching to people things that I'm not listening to myself or hearing from the Lord myself. But as I started looking at this message, there's this one passage, I couldn't remember the context or the text of it, so I got out good old concordance, you know, and started searching it out. And, uh, and, and it's in Isaiah, and that's the passage that I wanna share with you this morning. In, in Isaiah chapter 50, it has these words. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of a servant that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire, who encircle yourselves with firebrands. Walk in the light of your fire and among the brands you have set ablaze and this you will have from my hand, you will lie down in torment. Basically he says, you know, there's, there's a couple kinds of fires. One's the one God lights and there's one that you can light. He said, you know, who, what servant is there that, that, that walks in darkness? What servant of God that has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Now. For further reading, if you want to look at this passage a little bit clearer, I really encourage you to do so because the context of it is, uh, is within the context of the Lord Jesus. And it's a messianic chapter. And it's talking about that when the Lord comes and there'll be times when the servant of the Lord is just referred to here, which is Messiah. He's going to, there's going to be this time of darkness, all right? Where we know uh, the, the Lord Jesus went through that time in Gethsemane. We see that prophetically in Psalms 22, what would happen there. 
And so we know that this, there's a beautiful application. And in, in the model of what we're supposed to do when we're not sure what's going on, what to do at this point, we, the step we're supposed to take, you certainly can look to the Lord Jesus Christ who says, not my will, but thy will be done. So there's the, that, that's the application that's given out of Isaiah. But there is a great principle about, you know, what to do when you don't know what to do. This messianic verse of, you know, making sure that you trust in the Lord your God, that you don't kindle your own fire is certainly applicable here. And, and there's, it's a very practical word. It's a very practical word in, in regard to where I was at in the context of knowing where to go and sermon preparation. It is a very practical word in regard to where you are in your life at any time. It may be in the context of facing an issue in your own family or business or uh, looking for direction or having a, a conflict in a relationship or maybe something going on with the kids or could well be that, that very time that you're in life and we've all been there when it seems that all the odds are against us and we're just not sure what we're gonna do at this point in our life. Now, there's two things that you can do here according to Isaiah 50. One is verse 10, wait for the Lord to kindle the fire. Two, kindle your own fire. Now there's a lot of biblical uh, examples we could go to today about men or women who kindled their own fire and didn't wait to hear from the Lord. You, you see a, a great illustration that is Peter, you know, when the, when, uh, the Lord uh, is arrested and he kind of goes and sits by the wrong fire and he's there and he's compromising his, his walk and he's lying about his relationship to Jesus and, you know, and he's denying the Lord. He, he's at the wrong fire, so to say. Now, Judas is an example from the beginning, obviously, I think, that, that he comes on board and he's just looking to, to get Jesus to uh, fit the form that he wants him to fit. And there's a lot of people who do that today. You know, we want Jesus to be the Jesus of our making, but that's not the way it works. He's the Lord of glory and he's transforming us. We're not changing him. So if you're trying to get Jesus to fit your mold, your philosophy or your theology, no, it's, it's not going to work that way. You're going to have to embrace what he says. Then one of my favorites, and we've preached on David before in, uh, in, in this context, in 1 Samuel, uh, where David is running from King Saul. Remember, he's been embraced by Saul. He's lived in the palace. Saul's son, Jonathan, becomes his best friend. And with the encouragement and the counsel of his best friend, he's, he's, he realizes he better run for his life because Saul is out to kill him and, and he's pursuing him. And this goes on for several years. David, in the context of that time, has had the opportunity to kill Saul, but doesn't. Not gonna to touch God's anointed. So David comes to this place. Let me read this verse out of 1 Samuel 27. It says, and David, it's at the end of his frustration. He's discouraged, he's defeated. He doesn't know what to do anymore. It says, and David said in his heart, I will perish one day by the hand of Saul. He's gonna kill me. There is nothing better for me that I should speedily escape into the land of the Philistines. In other words, best thing I can do is run. Get out of here. And Saul will despair of me to seek for me anymore in the coast of Israel, and I will escape out of his hand. That's called lighting your own fire. And if you're interested in the history of David, pick it up from 1 Samuel 27 and run it through the next few chapters and see what happens. It's one mistake after another mistake. One decision heaped upon another bad decision, one upon the other. He gets to the point while he's in the land of the Philistines, he's so compromising that now when he hears that the Philistine kings are gonna go against Israel, he joins forces or at least attempts to join forces with them and their assault. When he gets to the front line, He's there and the other kings of the Philistines, there's one who's befriended him. The other king says, he's not going to battle with us. We'll get in the heat of the battle. He'll change his mind, he'll kill us all. This is David. They knew David better than David knew David. Amen. They knew who he was. He forgot who he was. And he lights his own fire. It ends up, you know, they reject him. He goes back to where his, his, his families are. He has several hundred men with him. They go back to this place. They're in camp called Ziklag. They get there and all they have is, a, is, is ruin and devastation. And enemies come in and taken everything. What they didn't take, they burned. And it says, and David's men spoke of stoning him. We're ready to kill David. 
It says, but David sought the Lord. And so he takes some steps in here. And you read through the Psalms, some of those steps, and read through his testimony of those steps. Those are some good biblical illustrations of lighting your own fire and how it ends up in trouble. But I bet today, if we were to take about five or six or seven hours, maybe longer, we won't, so just hold on. You'll be on time for lunch. You may even beat the Methodist, I'm not sure. But we could probably ask for testimonies today of people who've kindled their own fire, who've made their own decision, not waited to hear what God wanted to do, and made that decision. Well, and what does it say in verse 10, verse 11? They laid down in torment. They said, well, what have I done? I mean, I want to ask you, but how many of you could give a testimony like that today? I made a bad decision. It cost me. Come on, raise your hand. You don't have to give the test. Just raise. All right, see, they'd take a long time, wouldn't it? So I don't have to tell you how to fail here, do we? <laughs> we want to know how to succeed in the decisions that we need to make in these kind of situations. I mean, the worst thing you can do is, is what it says there in verse 11. You know, you kindle a fire, you encircle yourself with firebrands. In other words, you're taking your fire and you've got a bunch of other fires as well. And you think this is what, what I'm going to do. He says, you're just going to lie down in torment and you're going to miss God completely and you're going to waste your time. You know, there is a way. We, we, we easily can come up with a plan B, so to say, on our own and decide what we're going to do and then we're going to miss God. Proverbs 14 puts it like this. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the ends are what? Ways of death. This way looks good. Excuse me. Read the signs. The street sign says death this way. <laughs> But we're not going to look at the street signs. This is what I want to do. This looks good. It seems right to me. There's another passage there, just a couple of chapters after that in Proverbs 16, where it says, all the ways of man are clean in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the motives. It all looks right to me. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to make the choice I want to make. This is what I need to do. This is what I should do. This is what I think I ought to do. And that way leads to death. It leads to fear. It's the way of unbelief. It's the way of frustration. It's the way of loss. It's the way of bondage. The Bible says that the way of man is a snare. It's a trap. Why? Because man is born in sin. Man can't see past a moment. But God sees all things in all eternity, and God knows what your greatest needs are in your life. But we ignore that. We just light our own fire. Listen, let me give you a little simple lesson. You can't do the wrong thing and expect good results. You just can't do it. You can't do the wrong things and expect good results from that. So when you've come up with your plan and you know in the back of your mind that it's the wrong thing to do, don't think that just because you decide to go ahead and do it, it's going to be okay. It's going to work out. It's going to be fine. This is what I want. I don't care what the Bible says. I know what God says. I know what mama said. But hey, here's what I want to do. And that always equals trouble. The beautiful thing is that God's given us an answer and God's given us a, a way. And there is a right way and that right way is God's way. And let me just give you a little insight as I talk about these four steps this morning. One is this. God is doing a greater work than what most of us can see. God is conforming us and transforming us and he'll do whatever it takes to make sure that I am transformed and changed to what he wants me to be. In other words, the real issue with me and God and what God's doing in my life is not my, my good fortune or my happiness or my prosperity. Now that's pretty much the message of the day though, isn't it? We say, then if that's not what it is, what is it? If it's not happiness, then what God want me happy? Yes, he does want me happy, but that's not going to happen unless God does something else in my life, and that's start to make me more like Jesus. God's plan is to conform us, and that's what it tells us, and that's what Paul writes to the church in Romans chapter 8. He says, listen, is this, this is the will of God. Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed. What is God doing? Predestining us, predestined us to be conformed to the image of his dear son that we, he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God comes, he saves me, and he changes me. He makes me a new person. And that new person is now being shaped by the work of God through my circumstances, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through situations, through calamities as well as through good times. God is using all these things. All things work together for good. What's the good? This confirmation. That's what he's talking about in Romans 8. God wants us to be like him because the more I'm like him, the more I know him. And that's why God's intending 
ultimately is that I could walk with him, have fellowship with him, know him. That's not going to happen if I'm not like him. There's going to be some changes in my life. And many times the changes come at the hand of difficulty, at the hand of trials, at the hand of a, a refining fire. So remember, as you're deciding and making decisions, God is working a deeper work. He's doing a greater thing in you than what most of us really even begin to comprehend. God's making me more like Jesus each and every day. He's pressing me into himself that I can be all that he's designed me to be. And that's his way. That's his will. Psalm 17 is for me. This is David saying, I will behold thy face in righteousness and I will be satisfied with thy likeness when I awake. What's he saying? If I look to Jesus and I'm pursuing Christ and I'm yielding my heart, making righteous decisions, being what he's called me to be, he's working his likeness out in me. And I'm being conformed to the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The right way. God's way has this underlying work of the Holy Spirit in my life to make me more, excuse me, and more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So how, what are we doing? I have a decision to make. I don't know what to do. I've come to this dramatic crossroad in my life. And now a choice is going to be made. What am I going to have to do? Well, bottom line is, is this. I, it, it gets down to this. I'm going to believe God. You know, I want to believe God. I'm going to trust God. I really am going to have to rely on him. <coughs> and, excuse me. Something's trying to bite my throat. And not my own intuition. My own decisions, my own choices. And the bottom line for all these little steps I'm sharing with you, these four things, this is the first and the foremost and the most important. David summarized it in his own life this way. He says, trust in the Lord. Do good. In other words, do what he tells you to do. Dwell in the land. I love this part. Cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. He will do it. And he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way or because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Don't worry about others. What is God doing in your life? Catch these these, these points real quick. Uh, uh, See how it works out here where he says, trust in the Lord, delight yourself in the Lord, commit your way to the Lord, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. These are all actions, these are all steps that you can take when you don't know what to do or how to do perhaps what God's telling you to do. Let's look at it. This is the the context of what I believe. These four things are what it really means to, I believe, what we're getting down to trust in the Lord. Trust God. And the the bottom line here is trust God always. Even when you don't know what to do, you keep trusting God. Even when you're not sure what the next step's going to be, even when you're not sure where the Lord may be leading you, Trust God. That sounds so trite. No, it's not trite. There is, there is a, a level of commitment that's involved here. And I think it's this. And one, I'm going to willfully keep remembering who I am. Remember we said a while ago, David forgot who he was. The enemies knew who he was. The devil knows who you are. That's why he's always going to question it. He knew who Jesus was. But what did he say to Jesus? Oh, if you're really the son of God, three times he asked him. You're really the son of God. He didn't want you to know. Who, who am I? I'm a child of God. Who am I? I'm indwelt by the spirit of holy God. God lives in me. This body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit. They are God's. That's what the scripture says. Amen. Who are you today? And I think sometimes you need to make that declaration. Uh, This is who I am. I'm God's. And that gets down to this point of who I am. It's who I belong to. That's where that ushers out. Who I am is identified on the basis of belonging because the Bible says there's only two heads, all right, in all the cosmos. And one is the devil who is a pseudo head, a pseudo Lord, a pseudo authority. And then there's the Lord Jesus Christ. And every person ever born falls under that pseudo head to start with. And when they make a decision to come to Christ, no longer are they under his headship, they transfer it into the kingdom of light, out of the kingdom of darkness, the Bible says, into the kingdom of light, and now you're under a new headship. I belong to God. I belong to God. You belong to God. If you're a child of God, you belong to him. He is your God. But then in the context of that, I want to keep remembering what his promises are because what I'm trusting is his word. What I'm trusting is him. But if I don't know him, 
if I don't know his word, then I'm going to have a little trouble trusting. That's why we get back Sunday after Sunday. And I know I may sound like a clanging cymbal at some points, but you have to, on your own, by your own strength, get off your lazy behind and get in the Bible. Amen. Oh, that's pretty weak. Do it again. You know it's true. <laughs> you got to get in the book. I mean, if I were to sit here today and say, listen, I need you to do a little favor for me. Oh, yeah, Brother Joe, I love you. Anything. I'd like you to go to Istanbul and pick me up a falafel. I love falafel. Okay. How did I get there? I have no idea. Oh, by the way, you can't use a map. <laughs> I mean, you might get it all figured out in the end, but it'd be a long wait for my falafel. God doesn't tell us just randomly stuff. God gives us instruction. God, the Bible says it's a light. It's a, it's a lamp. It's a guide. It's, it's illumination. I mean, over and over again, it's instruction. It's his counsel. He's given it. And the Bible says he will guide me with his word. So they're called the precepts, the principles. If I don't know those, how am I ever going to know what to do in situations? And the more that you and the more that I take in and ingest the Bible... Not talk about the Bible, not go hear a sermon about the Bible, but personally, individually take some time and sit down and begin to absorb this. As we said last week, Job said, I've esteemed thy word more than my necessary food. This is more important than breakfast. This is more important than lunch. Some of y'all breakfast is not important too, but you ain't gonna skip a lunch, you skip breakfast. <laughs> I've esteemed this, this is more important. So I'm gonna trust God, but that means in trusting God, I'm gonna have to get in his word, aren't I? But it needs to be a daily habit. I mean, this is a good time of year for folks because a lot of people, and I've talked to several even today, says, you know, I started, I'm reading the Bible through this year. Well, that's a good thing to do. You say, well, I don't know how to do a systematic study. Then find out one of those little schedules that says how to read the Bible through in a year or the New Testament in 90 days and get to it and start reading it. And you'll be surprised what God starts showing you and what God speaks to you. And you'll be surprised what you retain that you didn't think you retained. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God, the scriptures say. So get back to the place. If you're making revolutions or resolutions, make that get back to the word of God and say, I need to get back in the word. That's why I know what to trust him for. I know how to trust him. And the more that I read it and the more I hear it, and the more I say it, the more faith becomes alive to me and the more I have to respond on, to step out on because I believe God. Trust God. What are you facing today? You can trust God. What are you dealing with? It's difficult. Trust God. The second point is this, and it goes right along with it. And I think there is a sequence that, that we have to go through here. The second point is this. Praise God. Always. Trust God. Always. Praise God. Always. Oh, Brother Joe, I'm, just not, I'm, not, I'm not one of those vocal Christians. Well, Repent. You can't be right with God and not be a person who praises the Lord. Amen. It's impossible. It's just impossible. You, you can't do it. It's, it's biblically, if you refuse to obey his commands, then obviously you're not right with God. And the Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul, mind, will, and emotions, will boast in the Lord. And the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. They won't be offended. He goes on to say, and magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. He heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. And on it goes. Over and over and over from Old Testament to New Testament, we have these commandments, not suggestions that we should bless the Lord, thank the Lord in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everything that comes out of our mouth, you know, of all things that come out, praise ought to be one of them. Praise should be coming out of our mouth. The Bible says, if you're a sweet fountain, it flows with sweet water. And the sweetest water is that of praise, that of exaltation. Thank God, love you, God, bless you, God. You're glorious to me. You've blessed my life continually. So what are you doing when you do that? Really, it, 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 isn't, it is, a, I believe it's a, it's, a, it's a manifestation of your trust, what we just talked about. How do you know he's trusting God? Because he's blessing the Lord. He's not cussing everybody out. He's blessing the Lord. How do you know he's trusting God in this area? Because he's honoring God, not only with his walk, but with his words. Guess what scripture says in Psalm 77, 13. 
Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? You know, he's blessed. There's nobody like our God. That's praise, all right? Ain't nobody like Jesus. That's praise. That's praise. But catch what he says. What about God's way? He says it's in the sanctuary. The word sanctuary there, if you look in any Hebrew dictionary, the word for sanctuary that means has to do with the presence of God. You, gotta, you get with God and you start praising God. You'll start understanding God's ways. And that's not just foreign. When you look at Psalm 73, Psalm 73 is a Psalm of Asaph and he's getting ready to backslide. He said, I mean, I've seen the wickedness of the wicked and the prosperity of the wicked. They get away with everything. Hey, I'm going to backslide. He says, I almost well and I backslid in verse 17. He says, till I came into the sanctuary of God, then I saw the end. He saw that where the ways of man would lead. If he was, he was getting ready to light his own fire and head that direction. He said, but I got God's presence. It changed everything. How do I get into God's presence? You start praising the Lord. Enter in, it says, with thanksgiving. Enter in with praise. That's how you enter in the presence of God. You start recognizing the presence of God. And one thing that praise is doing, it's a recognition that you're here in my life, Lord. Therefore, I'm communicating with you. The worst thing you can do in your marriage is never talk to each other. The worst thing you can do in your Christian relationship is never talk to Jesus. Never recognize him, never acknowledge his presence, and you'll have an empty Christian life. It's possible to do that. But you take time. To listen, you take time to hear, you take time to communicate. So praise God, that's a step. Jeremiah is what I call the, the prayer key. Call on me. Pick it up, may place the call. Call on me, I will show you the great and mighty things that you don't know. And by the way, can I say honestly, if we'll all be honest here, there's a lot going on in my life and in your life that we don't know about. There's a whole lot going on right now in your life. You have no idea what's even going on. Because right now, if we could pull back this veil of the physical and look into the spiritual realm, we would see angels, we would see demons, we'd see all kinds of activities going on. We'd see Satan laying pl plans and, and traps for us. We'd see the angels protecting us. We'd see the Holy Spirit guiding us. We don't see those things. We see through a glass darkly. God said, hey, you want to see a little bit more? Then you come to me and you talk to me. I'll show you the things you don't know. I'll give you some insight. And boy, how we ever need insight. Probably change you know, what we say a lot if we had some insight, amen? <laughs> It'd be more, more blessing than cursing if we start getting the insight that we need. Psalms 138 says, One, On the day I called, you did answer me. Thou didst make me bold with strength in my soul. Isn't that a great passage? The day I called, you answered me. God's hearing. We're not always seeing and we're not always listening. So how are we going to start? Brother Joe, I got this situation. I just don't know what to do. Here's what I'm thinking about. Oh, no, hold on. Whatever you're thinking about, don't strike a match. <laughs> don't light a fire near that thing. <laughs> it's combustible. Let's see what God has to say. Let's take some time. And let's, one, let's say we're going to trust God for an answer. And number two, we're going to begin to praise God. We're going to get in God's presence. We're going to spend time with God. We're going to communicate with God. And we're going to let God begin to open our ears, open our eyes, open our heart, and let us see what's really going on. The third step here is commit to God. Because once he does speak, there's a response. You know, that, that's why we even give invitations at our church. Because we believe that when the word of God goes out, God speaks to our hearts. I believe all kinds of things are going on when the word of God is preached, whether Tim's preaching or you're teaching or whatever. I believe that there's a lot in that unseen world we don't see. The Holy Spirit's planting a seed. God's opening your heart and mind to something. He's giving you a word of faith about something. He's acknowledging something. He's giving you peace about something. He may be healing something in your life. That's just the power of God's word, all right? So there's a lot that goes on. So that once I begin to submit to the Lord and worship him and trust him, then he begins to give me some revelation and some insight and this always involves, uh, obviously, the communication aspect, but also involves the action part. What am I going to do here? Lord, I'm going to come to you, and I'm going to begin to trust you with this thing. And I'm going to begin to praise you and believe that you're giving me the word and direction I'm going to need and I'm needing. At the same time, I'm committing this whole thing over into your lap and into your hands. The Bible says, cast your burden upon the Lord. Even Jesus said, cast your burdens on me and he will sustain you and he will never allow your righteousness to be, sh the righteous to be shaken. All right? God said, I'm going to take care of you is what he's saying. It's a problem. I'm going to, hey, don't sweat it. Chill out. 
I'm going to take care of this. But you need, you need to surrender it to me. And you need to surrender it with all your heart. Because what, what happens when we get to these kind of crisis in our life many times, when it's a big deal, we can't sleep at night. Our minds are going back and forth, you know. Maybe in a relationship thing where he said, she said, I said, you know, gets into all that stuff. We're rehearsing in our mind, you know. Am I the only one that does that? No. So he said, I'm a people too, all right. We just get off, we get twisted inside, we get in turmoil about it, we get frustrated about it, it robs us, it steals from us, and it cheats us. Here's what we ought to do. We ought to take that thing and roll it over to the Lord. Yes. Commit it to the Lord. Proverbs 16 says, you commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. God, I, I'm giving you everything I know to give you here, yielding everything I know to yield to here, and I, I am trusting with it. And what we talk about, we did the book of Philippians where Paul said, you know, he says, don't worry about anything, pray about everything. The reason so many people are so stressed out in the culture we live in, we just worry about everything instead of pray about stuff. Commit it to the Lord. Well, you know, this is a big deal. I just don't know what to do. I know what, I know what people are telling me to do. I know what things to do. But I, I'm not sure what my next step is. Hey, commit it to the Lord. 1 Peter 5 says, cast all your cares, all your anxiety upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. Let that sink in just a little bit. Kind of like a little tea bag. It needs to get in there a little bit longer. Get the juice out of it. <laughs> he cares for you. When's the last time you realized that? Oh, yeah, I know God loves me. No. He really does. <laughs> Well, there's not a lot lovable about me. Yeah, I know. Me either. <laughs> but he still cares for me. And he's committed to me. So much he sent his son to die for me, amen? He cares for you. For, so for before you run out the door and do something stupid, <laughs> he cares for you. He don't want you to do something stupid. So you commit this to the Lord. I remember, I remember some of y'all remember the late, great Mickey Bonner. I remember him preaching out of this passage. He had a great sermon on this one verse in Proverbs about commit your way to the Lord. And he, he got into this Hebrew illustration of what this word commit. And he, he talked about in the context of this word of commit, it means to literally to roll something over onto something. Like you'd push a stone down. But it, it, most time in the context of this, it was used of two people going along the road, one carrying a heavy burden, and they would take turns carrying it. And so they would stand back to back and have a way of rolling that load off onto the other person. He so said, that's exactly what you're, you're rolling that big load off and that big burden, whatever it is, you're going to roll it on over to shoulders that are obviously capable of handling, and that's the Lord. Amen. Cast my what? Anxiety. Better than Prozac. <laughs> Better than Xanax. I know some of y'all don't believe that. Better than any of the, what we call mother's little helpers is the grace of God. Put those things on him. What's he, he knows how to handle them. He's been there. He's walked where you've walked. Now, I said there's always this, this, involved, this, this aspect of communication and action, but there's also another part that it involves, and it involves waiting. And I left the word out. It should say this always involves waiting. Always. Sometimes just a little bit. Sometimes it could be a long time before your answer comes. But you wait. I need to act. No, you don't need to act until he tells you to act. Amen. But I need to move. No, you don't need to move until he tells you to move. Amen. You wait. You're waiting on a very reliable source. And remember, what's at the bottom of this whole thing is you becoming more like Jesus. All right, not you getting your answer. Amen. And so often our goal is to get the answer, not to be like Jesus. I think once our goals start lining up with his goals, maybe the answer comes a little sooner. But the idea is here that I'm going to wait upon the Lord. Listen to Psalms 37. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Now the word rest there is a word which means to stay in one place. What did David do? He said, oh, if I stay here, I'm going to die. I got to get out of Dodge. I got to move. I can't put up with him any longer. I can't deal with her anymore. I can't handle this problem. That neighbor's driving me crazy. That boss, I kill him if I stay another day. And on and on the list goes. Shut up. Be still. Sit down. Wait on the Lord. Don't light your own fire. Don't put your own kindling out there and kind of get a spark going. Rest in the Lord. 
rest, stay in one place. And here he says, wait patiently. Psalms 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. I mean, we've made a little chorus out of this song. I waited on the Lord my God. I waited and he heard my cry. It's the same thing, but it's not just to sing it, it's to do it. What does Psalm 62 say? My soul wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. Now this word wait is the same word here. It, it literally has to, to be quiet, stay in one place. Why? He says, because my hope. King James says, my expectation is from him. In other words, I'm standing here because I'm expecting God to speak to me. And I'm staying here because I'm expecting God to speak. Why don't you move? I, no, I'm expecting God to speak to me. Amen. Well, why don't you go over there? No, 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 that's where God told me to sit. Why don't you wait over there? No, no, that's where God told me to stay. But you know, you, you, can, you can still love God and go do what you want to do. Now, you can be an idiot too, but I'm not going to. <laughs> that's something that getting Jesus to fix my box, fit my box. That doesn't work that way, does it? I'm going to wait. What's God trying to say? Sometimes we're not hearing because there are things in the way. Sometimes sin is in the way. Sometimes God's got to deal with us about an issue. Sometimes there's some other situation God's working in. I don't see it all. But I have a trust in him that he's doing it all. So I'll sit here and I'll wait. In fact, there is one word, and I've shared this before from Psalms 37. We used it where the word is translated into wait. It's this word cool in the Hebrew language. Be cool. And it has to do with waiting, though, but it has to do with being twisted, turned, maybe even writhing or dancing or to drive something away or for something to be in grief or grievous for a while or to be waiting for something with an expectation. It's not just, what are you doing? I'm waiting on the Lord. He went that way. <laughs> you weren't paying attention. <laughs> He's over there. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, I was asleep in the Lord. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, there's, there's what is out, and there's this expectation is what he said. So there's this anticipation. We know what it's like to wait with an anticipation. We know what it's like to wait with a, you know, something's getting ready to happen. Now we do it without anxiety and we do it without fear. And we do it without wavering. And we do it without doubt. We're going to trust the Lord, all right? And we're going to praise the Lord, all right? And we're going to commit everything to the Lord. And that committing part says is this part where you have to wait upon the Lord and see what he does. Still with me? I'll let you wait a little bit longer. <laughs> Step four. All this is in the context. It has to do with godly counsel. Or even godly comfort. Sometimes we need somebody to speak a word to us. And God has those people around us. But we need to make ourselves available for that. You know, too often we, we kind of live as spiritual little nomads. You know, we have no land. Little spiritual little gremlins hiding up under the bridge somewhere. You know, I really don't know anybody. I have the Lord. That's wonderful. Well, the Lord is a relational God. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God, God's never been alone. That might shock you. <laughs> and in the beginning, God said, and let me make, no, it's not what he said, let us, right? Let us, let us make man, okay. And God intended for us to have relationships as well. And the Bible gives a lot of clear description about those relationships. Does it not have them need to be righteous relationships, holy relationships, you know, amongst godly people. The Bible talks about, warns us about having relationships with people who aren't godly and how that can affect our lives and business with people who aren't godly and how it can affect our business. There's a lot of instruction about this. But it is important, I think, in the context of needing to hear from God, there's been times that, that, that and it's, it's not outside the parameters of God's will for me to go to somebody who's godly. That's the key here, you know. Well, I know somebody and they're real smart. Listen, I'd rather have godly instead of smart Amen. any day. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take spiritually wise over worldly wise any day. And they're real smart. There is that time, I think, when we, hey, you know, I need to get some, some help. I'm seeking the Lord and, you know, and I believe God will put somebody even on your heart and mind that you should go in this context of, of this process of waiting. The Bible says a wise man will hear in, an increase in learning and a man of understanding will do what? He'll acquire wise counsel. So if I'm going to be a, a wise person, I need some wise counsel. All right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to have to acquire it. It means I'm going to look for it. I'm going to think about, okay, who do I know that has, has a reliable walk with God? Well, number one, I don't need to be perfect, but I know some people that are pressing on. All right? Who do I know that's pressing on? Who do I know that's mature in, in the faith? A lot of times we go get counsel, but it's not from this, these resources that I'm talking about. We get bad counsel. Well, my Uncle Bob said, you know, I'll just pop the guy in the nose and be done with it. 
How's that working for your Uncle Bob? <laughs> Where's he at? What's going on with him and his life? You know, well, my, my, my sister told me, you know, listen, all well and good if sister's godly or if Uncle Bob is godly. All right. By the way, you and I both know when it comes time for decisions, there's lots of opinions of what we ought to do. Amen. Uh, I don't know about you, what kind of job you have, what kind of world you're in, but the kind of world I'm living in, I got 200 and something people here today going to tell me what my job is. <laughs> We've all got an opinion, don't we, about everything? Well, if he's really a patriot, yes, we all get that in one way or the other right in our world that we live in. But what matters is what does God say? And God's got some people out there that are just there because he's blessed me with them and, you know, he had the word for me through them. Yes, sir, they have a life of their own, yes, but I'm just saying God has them in my life if I'll be faithful to, to go get some wisdom. And there's been lots of times when I've, I've been in situations I really needed. I, you know, one of my greatest fears, I think, in my life is I, I just don't want to miss God. You know, I, I just, I don't want to turn around five years and I say, oh, man, I missed that turn. <laughs> redeem the time because the days are evil. The best way to redeem the time is hear from God and what God has to say. Proverbs 11 says this, there, where there is no guidance, people fall. But in the abundance of counselors, there is victory. In other words, just find godly people. In fact, the word for counselor is good and wise advice. Get some wise advice. Get some good advice. And God surrounds us with people who have a wealth of righteous wisdom. Praise God. In our church especially, God's blessed us with some very mature saints of God. Amen. All right? Now, if they're telling you how mature they are, they're not the ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. They're also humble. I'll put it that way. They have a word from God. Amen. They, have a word, and they have a witness and they have a testimony. Let me show you how this works. Wise counsel versus, say, church counsel even. Kathy and I were going through, and I've used this illustration when I taught on faith years ago. But Kathy and I were going through a very difficult time in our finances. It's even before we had kids. You know how they can wreck your finances. <laughs> and the ministry, you know, we were traveling, going place to place, serving the Lord, people coming to Jesus, people, churches are getting right with God, all kinds of good stuff's going on. But, you know, I'm getting home at the end of each week and there's not enough money to pay the bills. And I said, well, you know, I have always heard church talk where God guides, he provides. How many of y'all have heard that? Uh -huh. yeah. And it rhymes. <laughs> Another one, where God leads, he feeds. Ah, that is so cute. But he wasn't feeding. And I was following his leadership. I was going where he's leading, but he wasn't feeding. All right, did God fail? Well, I know in the scripture, God doesn't fail. But it was a conundrum. It was a difficult place. So I went to one of the godless men I knew, and I said, hey, I've always heard where God guides, he provides. Where God leads, he feeds, and all the other little rhythmic things that we can say. What's going on here? He said, well, one, that's a lie. Excuse me, I'm getting ready to get some wise advice. Excuse me, I've always heard this, and doesn't the Bible teach this? That's not what the Bible teaches. Hold on. If I can't trust God, said, no, excuse me, you back up. Here's the answer. This is wise counsel. This guy didn't tell me to go out and invest my money in a certain place or do this with that money or do that with that money or do anything. He just said, here's the principle. That's the kind of counsel we need. Here's the principle. He said, God promises to provide for us as we believe him. Whatsoever you ask in faith, believing. Are you trusting God? Are you believing God? What are you expecting God to do? What are you asking God to do? What are you, what are you specifically talking to God about? I don't know you that little short conversation with him. Changed the way I prayed. Changed the way I acted. Changed my mindset about making bigger decisions in my life. Because I began to realize that if God tells me something, it doesn't matter what it is, I can do it. If I'm following him in faith, he's going to meet me right there. Faith. Well, I trust God. 
Will I believe God? That was the word I needed to hear. Am I, it gets back to what we talked about point one, though, isn't it? If I'm out here just saying, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, have whatever ministry I want to have, live wherever I want to live, live however I want to hey, that's all me lighting my own fire. Where's God want me? What's God want me to do? How, where's God want me living? How's God want me walking? What's God want me doing? That's where God meets me. It's a life that's being lived by faith. And that's for all of us. and not just for the preacher or some evangelist somewhere. Every one of us, we're living by faith. For all of us. So, well, you know, corporation pays me. Corporation, you wouldn't even be with a corporation if it wasn't for God. Yes. Amen. You, you wouldn't have legs to get up and feet to walk, to work, or get in your car and drive if it wasn't for God. So we trust God. Are you with me? Yes. Now catch this again. We trust God. I'm going to remember who I am, who I belong to, and what his promises are. So I've got to get in his word. I'm going to trust God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, getting the word of God. Number two, I'm going to start communicating with God. I'm going to do that through praise, through worship, through adoration. I'm going to start praising the Lord. I'm going to start taking things to God. I'm going to start communicating with God. I'm going to enter his presence with admiration, exaltation. I'm going to bless his name. I'm not going to be afraid of what people think if I start praising the Lord out loud. You know? The Bible says, praise looks comely, is the King James Version, upon his saints. You know what it means? It means praise looks good on you. All right. So if you're worrying about what to wear tomorrow, I put some clothes on, but put it on with praise, all right? <laughs> Adorn it with some praise because it looks good on you. It looks good on God's people. The world doesn't necessarily understand or like it, but it looks good on you. It's all right to say praise the Lord. It's all right to say thank you, Jesus. All right? It's all right. It might give somebody a heart attack. They'll have to get over that because you need to remember who you are. So I praise the Lord. And then as I'm beginning to praise God, God begins to speak to my heart. I, I'm continuing to commit it all to him. I'm rolling my works over on him. I'm trusting with him. I'm putting it in his hands. And that's a day by day step because, you know, I've laid everything down. I've been through a day where I've been trusting the Lord and giving everything over. And I wake up in the morning, all of a sudden, the first thing on my mind is, oh, that dilemma, that situation, that conflict, whatever it might be. Oh, what am I going to do? Well, I'm not going to sit here for another day and worry about it. I'm going to commit to the Lord. <laughs> I'm going to give it over to God. I'm going to trust God with it. I'm going to see what God does with it. I'm going to see how God leads me, how he guides me, how he opens my eyes to see the things that I haven't seen in this deal before. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to commit my ways to the Lord. And lastly, I'm going to talk to my brothers and sisters in Christ who walk with God, who love me, who care about me, who I love and care about. So next time, you get to the place. I just don't know what to do. Just remember this sermon. Hey, it's pretty simple. I'm going to trust the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to commit my ways to the Lord. I'm going to get some counsel if I need it. Amen. You know what hinders that more than anything else? Our pride. Just our dirty, stinking pride. Just always gets in the way, doesn't it? What do people think? What do people say? What do people, it doesn't matter what people think, say, or do. It just matters what God thinks and says and does. So get back to that. Walk in humility to see what God does with your life and in your life. Would you stand with your heads bowed? I think one of the best things that we could do this morning.